Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the latest in our Charles Munch retrospective. This is a survey of the Charles Munch Japanese RCA edition, which was not as big as the big box that came out on RCA, but which had a lot of the Munch stuff, and there was a time when it was very hard to find. And so I just like going through these things to to refresh our memories as to you know, what was available when and how things were released and how the record industry behaved. You see, I have this, maybe it's an arrogant you know, thought that this series of videos on YouTube isn't just about music, but it's also about the record industry. It's about recordings and how they've been sold and what's happened to them. And, and I'd like to document these things just so that people know what was going on. Maybe someday somebody will care or they'll be curious. I don't know, but I'm doing it anyway because I find it fascinating. And here is the latest clump. You see, they're in Japanese somehow, however Japanese goes. You know, it's all Japanese. And we begin with one of the great ones. Ah, and it's great in more ways than one because it's Schubert's great C major symphony, number nine, along with the unfinished. Gosh, what a what a dismal album cover this is, isn't it? It's sort of, sort of what is it, like a church thing with a bust of Schubert at the end of it or something. I don't know. It, it, it's, it's very unimaginative. So many of these album covers were kind of like ugh, back in the day. Anyway, um, so this is one of the great Schubert C majors. It's thrilling. It's one of the reference recordings along with George Sell. I mean, that's, that's it. And Joseph Cripps with the London Symphony, of course. Those are sort of the big three. And you had one on Columbia slash Sony, RCA, and uh, on Decca. And they're great. Of course, the Deutsche Grammophon had a Fort Wengler or six and, you know, Carrion and a bunch of other people. And finally, Carl Bohm with the Staatskapelle Dresden, which was, you know, a good competition to this stuff. But boy, this is just exciting and visceral and raw. And in the coda of the first movement, completely reorchestrated in vulgar parade ground fashion to have horns and trumpets blaring out the opening theme. And I don't care because Schubert himself, as you may know, um, never lived to hear the work. Um, it, it was it, it has all kinds of balance issues and things that need to be carefully adjusted. And whether you do that through changes in orchestration or through balanced things and dynamic twizzlers, you do something, right? Anyway, Munch does a lot. And it's got the best scherzo ever because it's a real presto, one in a bar. Oh, it's just thrilling. And no repeats, even better. Um, and the unfinished is just as good. Totally fabulous, amazing, glorious. So that was very exciting to run into again. And uh, this one is really good too, the Schumann Spring Symphony and Mendelssohn's Reformation. But what it doesn't tell you is that on the back here, see these little you know, little English and Japanese hoojis that you need a magnifying glass to read. You also get the Schumann Manfred Overture and the Genoviva Overture. And Genoviva particularly was a real novelty back in the day when this was recorded, which was like 19... Well, these are stereo and mono. So uh, let's see if it tells us. 1951 for Genoviva. Wow, is that 51? Good. You look at my get my handy dandy magnifying glass here. Yeah, 51. Yeah, that's the mono one. So that's like when Munch was like just starting in Boston. Actually, I don't think he'd even officially taken over in 51. So it was really kind of remarkable. Um, but the Spring Symphony is, is a very nice performance. It's not going to be one that people are, you know, going to be like hysterical over. But then again, it's not a work that people generally get hysterical over. And the Reformation Symphony is absolutely terrific. And, you know, you might... You might think he would do a good Reformation symphony because, because you know, well, because he was from Alsace and he was a Bach guy. He knew Albert Schweitzer and he was, he was, he was into all of that Reformation stuff. Munch was his concert master of the Leipzig Gewandhaus. He does a beautiful, beautiful job with it. You know, Mendelssohn didn't really care for the Reformation symphony. He didn't publish it in his lifetime. He didn't think it was very successful. But when you play it like this, oh, it's so successful. It's just wonderful. So there's that. Oh, uh, Symphony Fantastique, of course. And the Le Troyen Royal Hunt and Storm, which is a thrilling tone poem that's in the middle of the opera. But this this um, Symphony Fantastique is the earlier one, I believe. Yes, the 1954 stereo one, the one that everybody talks about. You know, But the truth of the matter is the second one is better. 
It really was. And the second one is here. Ta-da! Couple to Romeo and Juliet. That's the 1962 remake. Uh, let me see, right? 61. Is it 61 or 62? Back to the magnifying glass. 62. Yes, I remembered. There we are. 1962. Romeo and Juliet is 61. These are two stunning performances, part of the Munch Berlioz legacy, which is essential, like iconic. I mean, you know, if it's Munch and it's Berlioz, you've got to hear it. He did the Symphony Fantastique, I think, five times. I mean, there's there's two in Boston, and there was one on Decca, was there, or in Vienna, or something like that. But there's one in Hungary, and then there was one on EMI in France. And who knows? He was just dripping Symphony Fantastiques. It was one of his signature pieces. And nobody did the finale as excitingly and crazily as Munch did. But this Romeo and Juliet is every bit as good. It's phenomenally, excellently wonderful. Um, so that's awfully nice to have. And Romeo and Juliet became kind of a Boston thing. Because Seiji Ozawa in Boston did a stunning Romeo and Juliet. Absolutely. Maybe even better than this one. Really amazing. One of the great things that he ever did. So so let me see. Who are the cast singers? Rosalind Elias, uh, Cesare uh, Veretti, Valetti, Veretti, Venetti, uh, yes, Veretti. Sorry about that. And Giorgio Tozzi. I know it was Veretti. I mean, it's just the way that they write these things. You, you, you can't make out the letters. And so you think you've got it wrong. Anyway, there you go. And last but not least, Brahms 2 and 4 on one handy dandy CD. Now, Munch didn't do a complete Brahms cycle because he never did the third. Maybe that's a good thing because most people screw up the third. So I'm not going to complain. But this two, these, this perform these performances of 2 and 4 are just terrific. Again, they have all of the... The, the excitement he brought to the Schubert. I mean, he doesn't reorchestrate anything here that I've noticed terribly, but it's, it's really exciting Brahms and, and beautifully played and warmly recorded and spontaneous and passionate and full of, full of just, just that, you know, he was one of those guys who just knew the Brahms style. I mean, today, when you listen to Brahms symphony performances, they come in two varieties. They're either, they're either anal retentive because people are overawed by the fact that it's Brahms and they're very careful and very cautious and they play it very safe and very straight and very boring. Or, you know, they're adopting some sort of perverse period instrument methodology and they're just bizarre, you know, just sort of ridiculous. And, and you know, this was from a time when you had people like Klemper and, and, and Zell and, and, you know, you know, Bruno Walter, people who knew Brahms, Toscanini, they, they were from that period. The style was in everybody's bones. And they just did it well. Now, almost every time. Well, these are really distinguished performances of Brahms Symphonies 2 and 4. And if you don't know them, um, getting to know them will be a true joy and a wonderful, wonderful moment of discovery. I guarantee it. So there you have it. This is probably going to be the last in our Munch retrospectives. I think we should move on to somebody else at some point. Maybe we'll do the big box a little bit later. Maybe if it ever gets reissued, who knows? So anyway, keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me and take care.